All right, y'all, let's get started. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're excited to host former political prisoners Eric King, uh, Jason, and Jeremy Hammond. And they're going to be discussing state versus federal prisons, solidarity inside and out, and readjusting to life once released. Uh, Firestorm is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature events and books that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to book virtual events, both because we love being able to connect with folks at a distance and because we know that there's a lot of barriers to folks in our local community to attending things in person. Um, right now, uh, our schedule includes uh, three more conversations actually in the Rattling the Cages series, uh, including one in November, another one in November and one in December. Um, so on November 23rd, we're gonna be talking um, about women's prisons and on December 7th, uh, we're gonna be talking about um, becoming politicized while in prison. So definitely make sure to go ahead and register for those. I'll drop a link in the chat. Uh, tonight we're using Zoom um, and there is a Q&A tool, which uh, I hope that y'all will use. Um, there's also an open chat, so feel free to, to post along in there. Um, uh, Eric, Jason, and Jeremy may or may not be paying attention. So definitely, uh, if you've got questions for them, put it in the Q&A. That way we have a nice little queue of things to pull from at the end. Um, so yeah, uh, we're gonna get started here. Uh, quick bios. Jason Hammond is an anti-fascist from Chicago who participated in anti-racist action and other movements towards liberation and abolition. In 20, uh, 2012, Jason was arrested along with the Tinley Park Five after a militant action against a white supremacist conference. He spent 14 years in a Southern Illinois prison. 14 months. On release, 14 months, thank you. 14 <laughs> years would be a really long time. You gotta catch my typos. 14 months in a Southern Illinois prison and upon release doubled down on prisoner support and other modes of solidarity uh, with movements resisting um, the fascist state. Jason's also co-host of the Twin Trouble podcast as well as co-developer of the Riot and Rally indie game Smash Maga along with his brother, Jeremy. Speaking of Jeremy, Jeremy Hammond is an activist from Chicago, founder of the commu uh, computer security training website, Hack This Site and a former political prisoner connected to Anonymous. Arrested numerous times for his civil disobedience, Jeremy has served two prison sentences for his activism, one in connection with a hack of the pro-war protest warrior site in 2005, for which he served almost two years, that's two actual years, not two months, uh, and again in 2013 for hacking the private intelligence firm Stratfor and releasing data to WikiLeaks. Uh, he spent over nine years imprisoned in the second case. In 2019, while still in prison, Jeremy refused to cooperate with a federal grand jury in Vegas investigating WikiLeaks and its founder, Julian Assange, and uh, was held in civil contempt of court. He was released from prison in November 2020. Uh, his sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury, from our friends at Detritus. Uh, and then Eric, King joining us again, uh, one of the, the co-editors of the book, which I didn't actually show y'all. Beautiful, beautiful collection here. Yeah. Uh, Eric is a father, poet, author, and activist. Last December, he was released from the Supermax ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner for an active protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He was held in solitary confinement for years and was met with violence by guards throughout his incarceration. Eric has published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My Cell. His sentencing statement is included also in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. And Eric now works as a paralegal for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. Uh, thanks to all of y'all for joining us tonight. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Is it go time? Go for it, Eric. To um, you. <laughs> Hi, friends. So, Jeremy and Jason, I'm excited to talk to both of you. Um, I've met Jeremy before, obviously. Uh, Jason, we never met. So this is really exciting because I feel close to both of you, even though I've only met 50% of you. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. Started, uh, Jeremy, you did two bids? 
Yeah, um, plus a couple of county weeks here and there, right? Uh, no, I did two federal bids. My first one, I was at Greenville, two-year bid. I was like 19 for hacking. Yeah, one, one count, yeah. Were you shocked you didn't get sent to the CMU the second time? Um, <clears throat> yeah, good question. I right? was. I was shocked you didn't. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, the CMU being the one of the two federal prisons uh, that are the communications management unit where you only allow like one letter a month. One phone call a month or something, something along those lines, heavily monitored, heavily scrutinized that they normally go after like, like Muslim prisoners or uh, environmentalists or even like complex fraud cases. Oh, yeah, there's plenty of those right in the feds who are like still doing stuff from the inside. Good for them. Uh, no, they they did threaten to send me to the CMU once when I was um, one time I was uh, sent to the hole for like a month or two for you know, I had someone of my comrades running a Twitter account on my behalf. And during the um, the Ferguson uprising, someone had uh uh remember the dallas shooter who had also shot five cops i have that date cops? tattooed on my hand oh! <laughs> <laughs> july 7th july 7 2016 you know it's a it's a date to remember right oh uh, they, they did uh, they put the time in man good for them they roboted their ass though that was kind of sad but yeah so I, I had someone put a tweet on my behalf saying uh, it's about time that those cops started uh, getting a taste of their own medicine it's tit for tat support the dallas shooter so yeah, I was in the hole for a month and all that. And they said, oh, you're going to the CMU or you're going to the CMU and all that shit. I have a really hilariously written font. But they never did. They never did, honestly. Um, you know, I was uh, in mediums most of my bid without, you know, just kind of just a general amount of repression that people do experience. You know, we'll, get like, that. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> We're going to dive in. So um, I want to start with letting people know how both of you got into activism individually, collectively, whatever. Like what? got you into activism and then what led you to do what got you put in prison so it's like a two-part question so jason i don't think i've ever heard you speak so you're up first oh i got you i got you um so well both me and jeremy were politicized in high school um after 9 11 following the uh military adventurism of the u.s in iraq and afghanistan uh and and there's a lot of increased uh islamophobia racism and it was kind of like a turning point or like a which side are you on type situation for us. We were kind of observing these things. And um, uh, there was a student liberation collective that was a lot of students sort of organized and did a walkout in, in our high school and many others in, in the Illinois, Chicago suburban networks. Um, so, yeah, the anti-war movement is how we kind of became into, uh, into politics. Uh, and from from there, so we, uh, you know, we basically... We're trying to participate as much as possible. Then Occupy happened, of course. And during these times, we're trying to cut our teeth, learning from a lot of different places. And, um, you know, uh, Jeremy at one point was more of a, a summit hopper type going to the RNC um, and uh, getting arrested, protesting there. Um, but we were both getting arrested here and there in scrappy uh, protests. Uh, some kind of nonviolent direct action types, or sometimes cops just kind of arrest people randomly. Um, even if you don't want to, you know, you're always, uh, you know, a potential, uh, target for oppression if you stand up for people's rights and against imperialism. So, uh, we were learning a lot of things that, uh, we're still seeing parallels with like, uh, like with, with people resisting the genocidal war in Gaza right now, uh, with like when people are rising up doing encampments in colleges and, um, you know, building occupations, that's an interesting escalation too. That was, uh, so like people were learning a little bit maybe about like, and we were reading things like the failure of nonviolence and how nonviolence protects fake, but Peter Geller Goose. And so we were kind of like trying to experiment with like various ways during this time, this hike by time, uh, various other ways of resisting. Um, and we were both part, we both joined anti-racist action, which is kind of like a more tar like specific type of, uh, you know, <laughs> series of, uh, types of actions and strategies and tactics that um, were like, I guess, obviously for many, a little bit more arrestable and facing repression. Um, but Jeremy had already done some prison time. So we were kind of like already interested in like abolitionist uh, struggles and all that. Um, so, but, so we see a lot of the same parallels with like peace policing and like the DNC, for example, are different dynamics uh, with like more liberalizing tendencies within student protests and encampments and all of that so there's these these sort of things that we were trying to you know get a hold of and learn from like maybe 10 15 years ago during the anti-war movements of that era versus now is still being played out um and uh of course you know we, we're still participating in these roles even after 
you know, in these protests as, mu as much as our capacity, uh, which we will talk about more what we're doing afterwards, of course, later. But that's how we basically got involved, anti-war acts, anti-racism, um, smashing the fash and trying to understand and dismantle systemic racism, sexism. Jeremy, you got anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, like Jason said, the Bush years, um, I guess now by comparison, sometimes people say it seemed like more of an innocent time. But for us, it was like a, we were having to unlearn a lot of things we learned about America and just like going to anti-war marches and stuff like that. And basically seeing the powers that be just like, you know, obviously speaking truth to power isn't enough. Right. And so when we, we started getting involved in the anti-war movement, we started seeing other struggles, how it's all connected, how it is ultimately an issue of the state and capitalism as a whole and how. Issues like police brutality and like imperialism are kind of related, especially when you think about like Chicago police do train with Israel and all that. Um, and so we just thought that more was necessary to stop the machinery of war. Like, you know, it's holding a sign, picket signs is cool and stuff like that. But sometimes you have to play with the full deck. Sometimes you have to take things to the next level. And so honestly, being um, comfortable and law abiding in this sick genocidal society as complicity with it. So you have to you know, when you realize that the laws are there to keep the people in power in power. So in order to disrupt this balance, there's no means forward by picketing or writing your congressman. You got to take direct action. So that that's when we decided to get involved in um, direct action and, and uh, militant formations. Jason, what happened got you sent to prison? Well, so, I mean, the, the, the specific thing got me sent to prison is uh, just one specific tactic of groups like anti-racist action, which was the infiltrating of a group called the Illinois European Heritage Association is sort of like not even really a thinly, I know, fuck these assholes. I'm glad to say one of them is dead, at least, that I know about. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, not not directly a result of this, this shit specifically, but the so glad. Say. Yeah, we can say. Um, but yeah, so there was an infiltration in this group, um, and they're, they're essentially Nazis that are trying to, it was actually during the NATO protest in Chicago 2012, they had an alternative, like, it was like a European economic summit forum. There was basically like a meeting, like a banquet hall at a restaurant. Um, and so basically we had infiltrated their, their networks by, you know, with a sock account and building fake rapport with these fascists and, uh, you know, got the deets on when we're going to, uh, which, which is very interesting, fun shit to do. If you're, if you're, that's a fun thing that I can encourage people to get involved in. But, and then, so we found out where the location was and we basically went in, did the deed, um, uh, myself got arrested like a year later after an investigation. So, some folks at Chimney Park Five, later six myself, they were arrested basically like after the event, driving away. So, and they have all done their time uh, as well. Um, many of them three to six years uh, in Illinois prisons. Um, and uh, I was writing to them actually uh, under a pseudonym, of course, before the the feds worked with the Chimney, like the Chimney Park Police, like a. Uh, a, co a coordinated anti-terrorism task force had basically like provided some intel that helped identify myself in these in the in the videos and other other there was also dna i guess whatever but anyway so yeah we beat up some nazis and uh did got eventually dragged out the trial as long as i could until well they really had me on the dna and so i took the plea not cooperating and uh, and then really did the time it really um you know really it was uh they say i was guilty and i guess they're right i was guilty of being up a nazi <laughs> Were weapons involved? You know, I mean, like the thing is, there's plenty of uh, Im improvisation that's kind of like can can work towards favor because, like, I mean, a chair leg <laughs> is like that. Maybe not like uh, immediately assumed to be a weapon. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's been plenty of cases and trials where this this particular defense might have been used. Like, oh, with the intent, I was just carrying a chair leg, you know. But <laughs> it was armed assault, though. To be clear, yeah, it was <laughs> armed violence. They did they did get me on that. Uh, class. What, did uh did you all? These are impromptu questions, but it's popping up. So did you all know that this was going to be a conflict in train for that, like mixed martial arts, boxing, weapons? Or was it, let's just go see what these fucking punks are up to and give them some work? Well, I mean, not, not only was, uh, it's, there, there's been, IRA does other things too, but, uh, but yes, but I mean, trying to physically handle Nazis is like one well-known aspect of IRA stuff. But like in doing community self-defense, there's plenty of other reasons to, you know, train in mixed martial arts of a, or any kind of martial arts in various ways uh, for self-defense, uh, especially for queer and trans communities, people of color communities, right? These are very important things in, into these times, you know, and, and it was then too. Um, and uh, so these, these are like also community building, uh, you know, this is something that the group could do to uh, be with the community as well as pursue our own uh, individual 
our, our own campaigns against fascists in, in the area. Um, so that is a good way to just build bonding connection. Where if you're going to use the taxes or not, self defense is important for everybody. We we protect us. Ah, oh, big Jeremy, talk to me, friend. Tell me about your second bid. That's the one that I want to focus on. Yeah. What um, got you there? I mean, you know, when I got out the first time, I was on um paper, obviously supervised release, and I was uh wanting to be involved and stuff, but obviously I was not really sure the degree of surveillance and what you know whether I should jump in on like direct action and stuff like that again. And so I, I, I dabbled in a few different things, uh, different activist campaigns and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, uh, Anonymous actually was kicking off right around Occupy time anyways. And um, I just saw that it had like a lot of potential that they were like kind of almost by accident, sometimes getting into some really, really big targets. Uh, and they wanted to make it political and they um, were a little bit rough around the edges. And I really did appreciate kind of like their, um, like the internet sensibilities and their subversive use of humor to like as a, a way to like um, like embarrass those in power. Uh, yeah. But I was like, let's let's work, let's get it, let's get it right. You know what I mean? Let's let's do some damage and stuff like that beyond superficial defacements and stuff like that. So I, you know, when I was snooping around, I um the first thing I, I jumped in on the anonymous was a heck. Uh, I just saw a lot of the papers, please SB ten seventy stuff was in the news, and I was looking at Arizona police, and like I found a vulnerability in like the Arizona police. Um, Fraternal Order of Police website and it had like a, a roster of all their members and their pastors and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, okay, so that's illegal, right? I'm already in that territory. But you know, I could walk away, close it, I could cover my tracks. But I was like thinking to myself, like how many millions of people would have loved the chance to fuck these people over, but they don't have the same opportunity that I had at that particular moment because I had those type of skills. Man, people want get back. People would love to see get back. And so I felt like I, I didn't even have a choice in this matter, that it was just the right time for the moment. And so um that was like my first contribution to Anonymous. And then I definitely did for like the next nine months or so, kind of like a combination of things like direct action, hacking, revealing emails and passwords and defacing and deleting their servers and stuff like that, basically sabotage, uh, but also like inserting like a, a more explicitly anti-authoritarian politic into Anonymous that um, kind of, you know, it's, Anonymous is not a, not a political group per se without points of union and stuff like that. But we, uh, we was definitely going after the police. We was definitely going after military uh, and also computer security contractors who work with the police and fascists. We went after a lot of Nazis as well. Same thing, really, right? Um, so it was, uh, you know, I knew when I was decided to do it again that, like, I'm not going to get uh, a slap in the wrist like a 19-year-old this time around, even though generally the computer security laws are, you know, they're written for the sons and daughters of Congress people, white people. It's a fraud type of sentencing guideline structure. Oh. And stuff. They did max me, though, um, the second time. But I just, I knew that I was going to look at time, but I was like, you know, it's like the stand on your feet thing or or uh or uh yeah, die on your feet or stand on your knees man like shit had the shit's got to change man it's it's the time like we talked about i'm not saying i'm gonna start some fires but it's time that i wish i would like to see some fires started god bless you um so jason you did you did 20 months or how how long did you uh, do uh, it ended up being 14 months 14 was, months it was, and, it was a three and a half year sentence was that in a prison or did they keep you stuck in the jail so uh, I was actually bonded out. Uh, I did about maybe two months in Cook County, um, Cook County Jail, and uh, and Oops. then I did about like another fourteen months in um, South Southern Illinois, Vandalia, Flandalia, as it's called, because it historically has many white guards. Because of the obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, and even though it's like, of course, they say Illinois is a northern state, it would be like every week a fucking big truck would drive by with a giant Confederate flag, just driving right in front of the damn thing, in front of you, the whole yard and the whole prison. Like, they're, they're trying to make it known. Probably one of the guards. Um, so, and then, Jeremy, how much time and where did you do your time? <clears throat> um, all right, so the second bid, I was at um, MCC Chicago for, like, the first two weeks. I was transferred to New York, MCC New York, and also MDC Brooklyn. I was there for, like, about a year and a half to 20 months or something like that pretrial until I was sentenced. Then, um, and I'm skipping Oklahoma and Grady and all that because, you know, um, let's see, I was at Manchester for four years. Then I was at, uh, I actually made it to a low mile in Michigan for about a year. Uh, and then I was sent to Memphis, uh, federal uh, medium back again. Um, we got a bogus assault case. And then, um, shit, then, uh, oh yeah, that's right, the contempt hearing. Then I was, thought I was going to get out three months to the door. Then they uh, followed me, uh, subpoenaed me and wanted to hold me in contempt. And so that began like the next year and a half or so. Uh, I was at Alexandria Detention Center outside of D.C., which is where the Eastern District of Virginia was holding its WikiLeaks. I heard you were the cook there. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, you, they starve you to death, especially in the county jails. Like, I mean, I lost a lot of weight, especially the last two years of my sentence, man. Because, you know, you spend a lot of time in the yard where you're pushing weight and you're eating as much as you can. Then, then the last two years, they dogged my ass, man. I was in solitary for most of it and fucking eating county jail food, one hot meal a day type shit, right? But I did manage to weasel my way into the cook, uh, the kitchen. And so I was cooking for like about 500 people for six months. You know, I worked all types of jobs like like maybe you would have if they didn't dog your ass in solitary. <laughs> like, you know, so, um. But yes, yeah, I'm working in the kitchen. You know, it's hey, it's how you eat, man. And I was eating good. You know, off the guard straight sometimes. <laughs> well, I love hearing that. Um, so this is a unique opportunity for us because we have two people that were in two different types of prison, but both in prison. And it might be like old for you guys to talk about the differences, but I find this wildly interesting. Mm -hmm. So I would like to talk about the race dynamics, the the rec opportunities, the lockdowns. Like I want to know the difference between state prison and federal prison as you guys experienced it so whoever wants to go first just go first but i want to hear all of it and i'll jump in i'll go first with the the, the racial dynamics so i mean you've been in the fed so you already know that it's an extremely racially segregated and extremely clicked up type of environment so in midwest prisons and like in the prisons you're at manchester and yeah. Milan, maybe not Milan, but greenville those were still race-based yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, who you could sell with and stuff like that. But of course, that's that's not actually true. You could you don't you could be a race trader, you know what I mean? Like you could you don't have to go with the flow, you know what I mean? Like and honestly, like it's the type of thing where the fight doesn't end after you're arrested or after you're in jail, you know what I mean? You, the courts, that's another place you fight. And then when you're in the yard, you know what I mean? That's another fight. And so um dismantling systemic uh, racism. So yeah, the Midwest is like that, but I was kind of fortunate that I was able to like meet up with a bunch of folks from Chicago. Uh, and at some places it was the Midwest car and some places it was just like the Chicago car. I'm not a gang member, but like, I was very, they're cool. And they, they, they took me in, so to speak, um, with the white boys, obviously they not into that shit at all. The type of way I was living, you know what I mean? Like who you sit with, who you eat with, uh, you know, who you sell with. Did you eat with black folks? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good for you, bro. Well, I mean, again, I, I was kind of lucky, honestly, because I had a big high profile case and I'm not like a rat or a sex offender so that already puts me below the hierarchy maybe it would have been different in like maximum security prisons like the penitentiaries are much more vicious i'm told right uh and possibly yeah. even west Coast ones are much more vicious um but you know i never had to fight for that like in the same way that you had um with my fists so to speak but i got a big mouth you know what i mean but but mainly it's because like people do recognize you know that i was standing up for something and and honestly the white boys couldn't say shit because i showed them my paperwork too hell once in a while i actually did sit with them and be like and they were mad right because like i was fucking with everybody i was sitting with everybody but like they couldn't say shit because i'm legit you know what i mean but i did have a few problems man actually uh many problems uh you know, re in revolving that, you know, it's when you stand up against to go against the grain. Uh, and, I'm so and, impressed you did that shit. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, again, I was lucky I'm from Chicago and people knew knew my stuff. Um, but how many you know, GDs were on those yards? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, Manchester is a lot of people from Chicago. It was like 495 miles away. Right. So, you know, they you know, they put everybody from Chicago mm -hmm. there. Right. Because under the 500 mile or you know, whatever like that. Uh, Milan is very um, Memphis is very. Uh, St. Louis and Chicago sometimes ride together. Um, if that makes anything, the non-gang affiliated will ride together as a Midwest car sometimes. But I mean, it's it's ultimately it's about like I, I like the old convict code too. Your word, uh, you know what I mean, and your principles. And so really, it's like you ain't got shit except your principles. So you walk, you have to walk in a way that matches and that means everything to you much more than a fucking tray, you know. I love this guy, Jason. So tell me about like your custody level and then like what, like we're starting with racial relations. So like what the racial dynamics or politics were like in the state joint you were at. All right. So uh, Vandalia is a minimum Southern Illinois. Um, so it, it, they had a work camp where I ended up for a little bit of the time or actually more than half the time, but uh, cause I was in, I was so, uh, one of the charges, my charge was allowed your first video allowed to do like some of the classes, like the building trades and horticulture uh, which were the few and some of the better opportunities that you could possibly even get there. Um, and it, it takes about six months to get into these things anyway, but, uh, it was a, it was a minimum. There was a fence all the way around. Um, people have said that there was a time where there wasn't one, but. Is that the equivalent of a camp basically in the feds? I mean, so, so I, I've read oh. that many camps don't have fences, but this, yeah, but yeah, it's there, there was a work camp that was slightly better privileged. Like there people were dormed in rooms of 20 in a hundred like pod as opposed to everywhere, all, all of the dorms are like 100 in a dorm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's probably similar to I, a camp, I would, I might imagine. Um, I can't, I can't say I've never been to a camp, but, 
it was it was still a minimum um and then just being illinois uh you know basically downstate or anywhere south of highway 80 and is like a very like rural huge majority white kind of population generally as opposed to chicago and area which is like a lot more diverse and uh, and uh, but you, you look at the prisons are like largely majority, of course, people of color. And so there this was a huge dynamic, uh, even though there were um, people from all over Illinois in the prison I was at locals uh, from like Centralia, Centralia or wherever. But like the large majority of people from Cook County um, are like the Chicagoland area. Um, so that, that that dynamic played out. Um, and, mm -hmm. and Chicago and so also being a minimum, people weren't like as hardcore about like eating in, in racial cliques or gang cliques, even though there definitely was definitely gang cliques uh, where people were organizing themselves. Like, um, and uh, of course, there's, it's super racist, right? Everyone, uh, there's an expectation of like, you're going to hang with your own, of course, and you got to buck that every chance to get. And I hung out with people I knew from Chicago um, and and people that I just knew were from Chicago, talk about familiar places and all of that. Um, and uh, I got checked a few times by by some folks be like oh why are you on this is like oh so you just I don't, I don't really see why you're fucking so racist about this shit up um so you know even there were definitely of course with my charge i'm like oh my god i'm gonna run a bunch of fucking nazis are gonna ask for my goddamn charge <laughs> right um but but still uh even though like there were definitely a few folks who had fucking swazis on their goddamn bod they actually kept their mouths pretty quiet generally because the the, I, I don't think that like they really had as much pull in 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 Vandalia, maybe particularly, or it might also just be because it's a minimum place. So that means everyone there was five years or less. I think a lot of people are there are just trying to get out as quick as possible without trying to rile some more stuff. They don't really feel like. I think they saw those big ass knuckles you have. Look at those things. <laughs> oh, shit. No wonder they kept their mouth shut. I'm like, yeah. What about a racist? <laughs> what do you want to say? <laughs> Yeah. What would, Jason, what was the food situation like? All right. Um, well, it was that they, they definitely had provided meals uh, three times a day, hot meals. Um, actually, I would say breakfast really provide was sometimes just bread and uh, jet, peanut butter and jelly and an egg, for a boiled egg, right? So at least two, maybe three hots a day. Uh, but it was garbage, right? It wasn't, I wouldn't, it's, it's definitely a step up from Cook County Jail, which is, as in county jails is not it's not unique it's some of the worst food that you can force someone honestly eat. between the two of you 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 dudes are at like the three worst pre-trial facilities on earth like those <laughs> things are rough the <laughs> mbc's and then cook yeah. well it's terrible cook county is like the large one of the largest maybe by land but it's also notorious for being particularly bad i think between rikers and, bad. Yeah. yes <laughs> that is what it's known for Man, I've been um, in that motherfucker like eight times, man. Everything yeah. from, my God, man. It's actually better than it used to be. It used to be like twice as crowded and guards are just so vicious and people are still dying there all the time and they're covering it up. No medical care, no books either. There's no library. There's no law library. It's, it's one of the worst ones. And, and do you know, we do a lot of prisoner support and we're looking at some of these inmate numbers like, damn, this motherfucker been there for fucking 10 years. Damn, bag of bones type shit, man. They need to shut that thing down, man. And during the COVID pandemic too, that was... Uh, the number one COVID spot uh, in the country, uh, actually. Okay. The hot spot. It was a super spreader. Uh, yeah. Like uh, they, they traced like maybe like one quarter of all cases in Illinois came from the Cook County. Is like at least that's what the data said at the time was Cook County Jail was a mini was definitely a super spreader. I mean, when we I was a uh, I was being held for my second charge in the Inglewood shoe when when COVID hit, and when it happened, they took away soap and said they couldn't afford it anymore. So we didn't have soap, and then they said the commissary was out of medicine, so we couldn't buy medicine and couldn't buy soap. <laughs> you fucking pukes, uh, Jeremy. You were at mediums and lows. Those are sometimes known for better recreation and better food. Like, did you experience that? Like, what was your rec situation like? Did you have sports? Did you have yeah. uh, hobbies, shit like that? Yeah. <clears throat> so they're not often locked down as much as like obviously some of the higher or you know. Super max, yeah. but um, yeah, they're they're considered opens, right? The lows and mediums are considered open, where you could go like every hour they do a move, and you have five minutes to either go to somewhere or back from somewhere. You go to rec. Uh, they often do rec at least like three morning, afternoon, and evening sometimes, unless it's a staff shortage or whatever the fuck, or the lightning or whatever. Uh, and yeah, so you can walk in circles on the track. Um, you know, during the summer they do do sometimes they have sports and stuff like that. And so I always tried to play softball every year that I could, and I played a total of eight years of prison softball. So that's kind of cool. Um, 
Yeah. And so once in a while, like I've been at one or two places that also have like a music program. Um, and so, yeah, I was able to fuck around. I actually learned guitar in prison my first bid um, because my brother sent me, he sent me um, guitar tabs and, and music theory stuff like that. And I was able to teach myself guitar by checking out a guitar with your ID and you could use it for a couple of hours. And yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. But one of I, you, I, don't remember, I don't remember which one, but in like 2014 or 15, one of you was in the ABC newsletter and you were listing the bands that they had like on the MP3 thing so that other people would know. Which one was that? Do you remember either of you? Yeah, I, I think I did like an article for Maximum Rock and Roll. Maybe it was printed and I was talking about the MP3 programs and like uh, what songs. That was helpful for me. I love that. I was just checking off the band. Oh, yeah. No, that's so cool. Yeah. I'm so glad actually someone did get to appreciate them. Yeah, I put a bunch of punk bands, I think. I think like Op Ivy. Uh, oh, shit, what else do they have on They're there? Like just 15 punk bands. Yeah, and, and honestly, uh, of the Walmart music section, honestly, obviously they don't have any like, you know, DIY punk bands or anything like that. And it's all censored and all that stuff. And you got to pay a buck 50 and all that shit. But man, you'd be getting the, the your money's worth out that buck 50, right? Listen to that shit over and over and over. I didn't listen to any of those songs ever again. I never. <laughs> I, uh, I I didn't have my MP3 the last like several years, obviously. But even when I finally got it back, like, I would not listen to a single one of those songs. No. no. You're dead. Like, you can take it home and unlock it for $15. Man, I'm fucking leaving that thing over there so someone can turn it into a battery for the radio or something. You know? Something. Jason, did you have access to music like that? All right. So when I was in, it was the period between when they had taped radio, like Walkmans, basically. Um, they had stopped doing that uh, for a while, so it was they weren't even selling any radios or tapes because they were eventually going to do MP3 players. So they started installing kiosks, which weren't finished by the time I was in there. Um, so any radio you could even get it was from someone who's already been there for a while, and it was kind of shared and protected by the folks, you know, and whoever they wanted to share. But I, I, I did share with someone, um, and it was like mostly uh, like not '90s music, right? So I would be like listening to Green Day and. Uh, uh, fucking offspring but it would be like the, the thing's been up like 10 years so it would be playing slower i'd be trying to spin it to get it to go faster it doesn't sound like it but uh but yeah but and the radio of course you know um it's a it's like southern illinois in like middle i don't say middle of nowhere but they don't have an abundance of radio stations like in the area so that's not unlike pretty much you couldn't get chicago radio no no oh. uh, and it's, so it would just be like kind of one of like a some clear channel mainstream pop or and it would be uh our country and the mainstream pop stuff is like i would be listening to other people listening to it at night and i'm like i know all the melodies but none of the words because i hear the same song every goddamn night like, is that what like, got you involved in pop music to where you formed your boy band you know i i can hum the melodies but i don't know any of the words you know <laughs> just kidding um so i want to talk about shit that goes on inside um you both you both touched on the racial element and I want people to understand that like every prison is different that way. And like everyone might not be as severe, but they all exist on this separation where divide and conquer one way or another, whether it's rats, tattletales, racial shit, um, or staff repression. So I don't know if either of you face anything like that pre-trial trial, trial uh, during your bid, but how was your interactions with staff, either SIS or whatever the intelligence agency is there with mail, with calls, just in general, what, uh, what, if any experiences did you have with staff? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're on my line quite a bit, right? Especially the first couple of years. Oh, wait, Manchester's known for having like really shitty guards, even as a Yeah, man, like, yeah it's weird. Kentucky, man. Eat the, the cold prison belt, actually, Appalachia, right? There's a, a disproportionate amount of prisons over there. Uh, sure. And it's a very insular community, mostly former military uh, who have no connection to the the people that are locked up, usually from urban areas. Um, and so, yeah, no, they were there on my line, man. Uh, I didn't have email or phone for, uh, I should say, email or computer. And I had to add the phone manually type shit for the first like, year and a half. Then when I got to Manchester, they uh, I was on the email thing to where it would only send all my messages once a week. And I'd receive all my messages once a week when the SS clicks the button. And they're just on me for mail generally like they... Um, they are, and I've had a number of like they were reading my stuff, and they I, they gave me a couple shots here and there for various mail or phone infractions. Sometimes they would just take my shit for six months. Um, yeah, I mean I've been in a whole I don't know a dozen times. I wrote I wrote a couple articles about it. I can't even remember all the individual circumstances. Sometimes it's stuff that like I knew I was doing it. I knew I could get you know I made a lot of wine right. I got I went the whole for that. But other times it was stuff that was bullshit. You know what I mean? Like um, frankly, like that shit was that shit that happened in Milan. 
Oh, what what, what, shit, what happened to my old man? I, I was definitely, oh yeah, the, the assault, yeah, the um, a staff assault, yeah, so uh, oh, my was one of the six federal prisons that had that for, uh, second chance uh, pilot program for the education, so I was actually about to get my degree type shit, yeah, I was like six months from getting an associates and all that, but some dumbass cop who was notoriously one of the worst cops on the yard, right, and they're always are, and you usually know who you're there, and I try to duck them, not even have a type of interaction with them, but he was on the other side of a door, and they called to move, and the one cop on the inside of the unit wasn't fucking opening the key. He was just over somewhere else. And so this one cop opened it from the other side, and I didn't even know there's no window or anything. I pushed the door, and he pushes into him, just push his shoulder. And then he kind of threw me up against the wall. I was trying to get me to fight him and stuff like that, but I wasn't going for it. But then he did lock me up, and I did, like I think, like a month and a half in the hole. was transferred back to the medium. Could have had a degree, right, but a bogus assault. But then again, honestly, though, that's just everyday stuff. Anyone who does any type of large amount of time is going to have these type of incidental uh interactions you're gonna do whole time even if you stay straight you know i mean the whole time with your head down you're still gonna end up going the hole so again uh, i got them more than they got me most of the time <laughs> you uh you talked about um the email situation and not everyone listening will always understand what that means so when you're in the feds to get email you log into your true links it's a true link system you pay money and then sis if you're not on any restrictions your mail just flows in your email you can read it basically same time Jeremy, will you explain like what you were talking about when you said the once a week thing? Yeah. So, I mean, and they told me when I got there that they're going to do this, right? SIS is like the uh, intelligence detectives of the prison. You know, um, it stands for intelligence, but I'd never attribute that to any cops, right? The dumbest but, piece of shit I've ever made. You, know. <laughs> you know, you get them just by a false cover most time because they can't even read, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so anyways, yeah, my emails, uh, they did turn my emails on, but when I sent an email, it wouldn't actually arrive until like an SIS actually sat down and looked at the queue and clicked the button each time they screened them before they receive or sent because they think that you're going to incite or plot crimes or whatever like that, you know what I mean? Uh, and I'm just going to take this moment, it's something I wanted to bring up later, but I definitely think that the lack of internet access, period, like to, to people behind bars is one of the biggest atrocities of this system. And, so, and granted, there's plenty, obviously, to be said. But the fact that we're locking people up for years and years and years without access to the same set of information or the ability to look stuff up on their own, going to the world without apartments or jobs, can't even use that stuff without a smartphone, never having used one or something. I never had a smartphone until I was released from prison, right? And I, I'm good at computers. I caught up, but I'm just knowing that this is just one other way that they keep people down. And so, I, my big thing is honestly like get the internet to the people behind bars, man. Get them fucking phones, unrestricted, unmonitored. And so that's why we're doing stuff like sending it's going down and newsletters and all the books. We'll talk about it later. But yeah, so that was my email stitch, which is to say a lot. It's not email, actually. It's not actually internet and stuff like that, right? It's like a glorified texting services that charges you out the ass in some weird dystopian monitoring uh, future, which is the future they want for all of us, which is something I would like to talk about later because we're definitely trying to stop this techno fascist utopia. I uh I once sent an email to my wife. This was when I, I did a month and a half at a low when I first started and I sent an email and I said like I love you this many times. And it was like I just typed random numbers and I had to go in and talk to SIS and they said they're gonna try to prosecute me. They said it was like passing messages, like you fucking low life clowns. Um, Jason, did you face anything like that? Like you were at a minimum, but it's still prison. Was there anything like that for your calls or mail or anything? Um, well, so I did get a lot of mail, uh, which is, uh, which talk is about uh, support next. Yeah, that, that, that was, uh, key pivotal and, and, and we know, and this needs to be said and we need to continue on that. Uh, uh, so it's, that was really what kind of flagged me in their minds. Like, okay, why is this person getting on the mail? So they, they looked me up and they said, yeah, like, we know who you are, you know, you're not doing anything. I'm just like, so, but, you know, I mean, I did do a few writings that, that were like published in here, here and there. Um, but I, I didn't get as much scrutiny as, you know, they, 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 had, they wanted to let me know that they were kind of like aware and that like, because they also didn't want like a scene because I was getting a lot of books and letters um, or whatever. So that's, yeah, well, uh, I would say that they, they were kind of curious about me, but I didn't give any reason to particularly think okay. that they need to put me in any... Are, are particular are they i have any evidence that they were doing any monitoring of the letters i was sending out good thank goodness um so you alluded to it but i do want to talk about support and there's good and bad about prison support for real like none of us are perfect none of them are perfect um but it is a lifeline so i i also know that like different parts of our movement support in different ways like the earth liberation or animal people will get the the thousand letters a day. Like I talked to Jake, he was getting a hundred letters a week. 
um, anti-fascists will get like that crowd. So I'd like to know, like you both were very different in your charges. So I'd like to know about like the individual support you received. And um, I don't want to say what you would have like, if, was there anything that you wish they had known that they weren't able to do or didn't do? So either of you can start, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, we were some of the lucky ones that actually had the attention and support of the people at large. As as we both know, you know, when mail comes around, you know what I mean? Um, you know, most folks just over the years are just forgotten and abandoned, uh, off, you know, no fault of their own or even to the, their loved ones and stuff like that. But, you know, it's a damn shame uh, that people are just everyday folks. So, so. You know, we, we do a lot of prisoner support and solidarity now. Uh, and so we, you know, it's great to, you know, we, we definitely support political prisoners and stuff like that. We have formations for those type of things, but we definitely also are free them all. Like we, we don't put like political prisoners or anybody else on any type of pedestal. So we support everybody. Uh, that being said, like we had a tremendous amount of support. I, I did especially. Um, I had the type of case that was actually kind of like acceptable to a lot of like more mainstream liberals because, oh, government transparency, right? Like it's an easy thing for people. I saw to you in Wired. <laughs> yeah you know I mean? I mean like honestly so i got support from some people who sometimes say that oh he's not a criminal right like i'm just like mm, well, well, interesting well i'm also involved in militant direct action and support a lot of other things that maybe you would so i did try to um i did try to uh oh, excuse me oh my god oh i know um use okay. that from that chant to advocate for abolition and support uh, all folks for those um and so, yeah, uh, support comes out of the next question. Support comes in many forms. We got mail every day, got books every day. It was so amazing to go to court and see fucking our friends and family and stuff like that in court. Uh, and, and like Jason said, like they notice, right? They notice that the person is supported and loved and stuff like that. And maybe I think that maybe it puts them on guard that they think that they are less likely to be able to do some things to some people if they think that there is eyes on the situation. Um, so that's why phone zaps and stuff like that are also important and stuff like that. They work. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. damn, they work. Yeah, argument with an elder old shithead who was trying to like discourage people from doing phone call-ins like motherfucker these things saved my life like what are we talking about yeah right, this isn't about me i apologize you got me hot no, <laughs> well, no, well no no you're saying an example of how that shit actually made a material difference in your life you know what i mean and honestly for for most folks that's what they're looking for uh is is a little bit of attention from the public to, to the situation like if only people on the outside knew what was happening and so every time someone on the inside is throwing that beacon up they send a, a message or a phone zap or can you please tell people about the situation or like a dude they're that's fucking reaching out for support man over the wire man and we got to fucking answer the call you know like so yeah, phones out, and that's another, uh, it actually is extremely satisfying. That's what you're talking about my voice earlier and stuff like that, like giving it to them raw on the phone and yelling and talking circles around these foolios because, you know, when you first call them and stuff like that, they might think that they're just talking to a friend or a family who actually doesn't know anything and they could talk any kind of way. Like, you know, how a guard talks to a prisoner, right? Like, this. well, that's just the way it is and stuff like that. And be like, oh, well, actually, program statements, stuff, 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 stuff. well, actually, we are an authorized publisher that is like, actually, you are violating Mandela law, the Illinois law, all that shit. They're like, oh, shit. I was like, yeah, let me talk to your supervisor. Also, what's your name? You know what I mean? You just, you just man, you could, uh, and I record every call too. Uh, and so, or shoot too. <laughs> hell yeah i do fucking so we gotta let these people know that they got eyes on them and they let the people inside that we got their back so jason how was your support all right well so you know the the book's key because um i kind of uh kind of don't read as much as i did back then anymore i still try to read but i try to revise it's book hard for, book for life but, yeah you know but uh but you know, you could always uh, keep reading, I guess. But anyway, the letters of support, it was really good to hear from people. And that's actually, uh, you know, sometimes it's interest, it's hard or difficult for people to kind of like, okay, you got the pen and paper. I'm going to write someone who I've never talked to, doesn't know who I am. I've never met this person, but I, I support the cause, which is maybe why I'm writing them. Or maybe I should just do a, a pen pal situation here, right? Why? So you're trying to like maybe talk about your, let's say, because uh, I've written prison, of course, too. You're talking about your day and like, you're like oh, does this person really want to hear about my cool bike ride or something, you know? I, I don't know. I, I smile when I heard about people telling me about the cool this things that that they were doing in their lives, like this tree or something. Because like I, I miss a tree, you know, when I was in there, right? So um, it it was good to hear that. And I know it it might seem like you don't want to like feel like you're bragging to someone who can't enjoy the same sort of like simple pleasures like that. But it is nice to hear that people are actually doing things. But more importantly, are are say also important is that people were writing and telling me about you know using different names, of course, but just like the cool things that they were 
had heard about or something that people were doing to continue on struggle. And I think that is like another great way to support like movement, you know, political prisoners is like can continue, you know, the torch, the, uh, you know, literally the torch, uh, you know, what, what, what the, the political projects that they're involved in, you continue to support and move towards because like, um, like the, uh, when you're writing someone in prison and you're thinking like, wait, so they're a prisoner and I'm in the free world. It's like one, you're not in the free world. And two, they are also free with their own ideas as well. So, uh, and their, their own thoughts in, 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 in one way, in one level. So, uh, and, and, and the thing is like, maybe they got caught. It was like, you really, maybe, maybe you, you could be in the exact same position they are in one day. Um, and maybe that the, the person who write to might not have been caught, um, so I don't know, just try to bake down the barriers in a number of different ways. Uh, but I will say that also to what point Jeremy made and, and, and everyone knows that prisoners are some of the most underlooked folks and, and forgotten about in society. And when you, uh, we would like to see that be, it's not like a solution. It's like, oh, we, if every prisoner got books, then it would be an okay society. It's like, oh, we need to burn the prison down. But there are so many folks who just are not getting to support this, to get them through like, some of the most vulnerable and just darkest moments in the, potentially of their life. And uh, and every single letter that goes through has the potential to change someone and, and the people around them too. Because when I was getting the books, um, I would be sharing them, of course. Everyone would watch, like, oh, who are you getting all these books? I was like, gonna oh, ask. You had to. Like, I, I knew for a fact you both did. I would have never oh, doubted for a second. Of course, there was like, um, it's, it's not like there's, uh, I, I would get like articles too, and I would just like, there would be like a little area where there used to be a fire extinguisher uh and uh i would like leave articles there even if i don't have like report that everyone is like i'm just leaving it there just so someone wanted by and pick up a read and i'd be see people reading it. it's great oh man so this shit when you support one person you actually support the people around them too i love you both um so let's talk about when you got out of prison um you both did like different spectrums of time but like time is time and getting out can be hard it can be great it can be scary it can be exciting so i'd like to know like what your experiences were like the first six months, year, two years, like what you struggled with and like what made you, like what gave you excitement, what gave you joy, like just stuff like that, just a broad goods and bads or sads, nervouses and excitements and greats. Wow, yeah. I go first? Yeah, good. I got an April Fool's Day and when they called the name, I really did think it was a goddamn joke. <laughs> Cause it was like, it was like, I got on Friday. I was actually set to release in the weekend. Sometimes they do it later. Right. And like the yeah. after the weekend, but it was, it was, uh, they let me out on Friday, April 1st. So that was cool. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, definitely. Of course the readjustment thing is I didn't do a ton of time like you guys did. Um, and, and, and I, I still, my, a lot of my friends were still around like in the same neighborhoods and areas. Right. I did 14 months for, and so, um, it, it was, it was even so that's still enough time that people just move on from their things. Um, and, uh, it's definitely a little bit of culture shock, but one of the things that did happen was, uh, I, I became more attuned to like the electronic monitoring things uh, of course, post-release, you might get, you know, the fucking ankle shackle. Um, and, uh, and that, that has, of course, has since expanded as a carceral tactic, e e-carceration, right? Um, and so like, I, I would be hit to more things like, okay, so I was trying to apply for jobs when I got out, but the, the shit is so poorly run. It's like, I never got the message back many times. To for I could I missed interviews. Also, I missed my grandparents' like my grandpa's funeral, and then just because they didn't answer their phone enough to like get sent a um, you know, just an approval to go out of state visit or something. Um, and so you know you you, you see little things about it's like once you you think you're got you're out you're actually you you're not. And I don't mean just beyond the three months. Of course, you know um, I I applied to various job things and just get uh just rejected on no basis. Right, of course, the felony. Right. Um. And, and and that's really the that's that's an issue that like I guess most people think is like well you're out of prison so you're okay you're free now it's like I don't know there's plenty plenty of people and, and just besides just like the on like the the systemic levels there's like there's so much psychological levels is like I just like see we, we we develop a lot of tools to kind of just like help exist in like you know this society like after release right like we have a lot of patience right like we develop that in prison and like maybe like perspective on like so like these things um. I don't know. They do care. They do carry on. Um, and yeah, and you and you see people who don't. I don't know. And you and you're like, oh, that's that's unfortunate. I think that maybe you don't have the pers uh, the patience enough to give someone a chance to kind of like, uh, you know, learn maybe from their from their from their from their ways or whatever, you know, or just like le learn to deal with stuff in a certain way. It's like I don't know. 
maybe we're like once once you leave prison, I guess you carry it with you for the rest of your life. <clears throat> yeah, um, that was good. Um, yeah. So actually, as a matter of fact, next week is my uh, four year anniversary of being out. I was released on uh, November, uh, mid November uh, last last week. Uh, four years uh, I've been out. Um, yeah. So I, I was at the halfway house for two two or three months, then in home confinement for a couple of weeks on the the band. Um, and I. Uh, yeah, then I was on paper for a year or so until I was lucky to have an attorney uh, beat my supervised release conditions completely. Uh, so after a year, you know, you could file for that. Um, yeah, it was it was tough. Uh, but then again, I would say I was, uh, again, lucky and fortunate to have a community and a family um, who did take care of most of my physical needs uh, that I didn't have to actually struggle like most people do when they're released. Um, so there's that. Oh, uh, I was on a bunch of weird ass monitoring shit, man. That was the most notable thing of my my release is that like um like my computer and my phone had to have like a device on it that recorded all my traffic and all my messages and all the websites I visit and they should look at my screen and stuff like that. Uh yeah, so and I had to pay for it too, like sixty bucks a month to some private ass company. Um for basically a virus. Those filthy bastards made you I know. pay for it. Yeah, yeah. Um and and she would like comment to me sometimes randomly about like some of the messages I'm sending and stuff like that. She was actually on it. Yeah, and like twice he like threatened to violate me um over stuff I was doing on the computer, like just petty bullshit frivolous stuff. Like she tried to say that like one of my conditions, I had a bunch of weird conditions, like you can't affiliate with a civil disobedience group or you can't affiliate with electronic civil disobedience or civil disobedience or you can't use encryption or you can't use a proxy server, stuff like this, that like my probation officer, frankly, just didn't even understand those things. Uh, and so she had a suite of tools that gave her keyword notifications and, and flagged stuff like that. And so she tried to violate me twice because um, of our video game that we made, the Smash MAGA video game, um, which is like an anti-fascist brawler, right? You could, you know, beat up a bunch of Trump supporters and all that shit, you know, cool stuff, right? Uh, she actually tried to say, oh yeah, we need to go to the judge to see if she would consider this game anti-fascist, see if anti-fascist is a civil disobedience, like uh, there'd be violation. I was like, yeah, I right, go do that, by the way. Go do that, right? Like <laughs> This was 2021, so Antifa was still in like the mind of all law right, right. terrorists. Yeah, I was in the halfway house when I watched Jan 6, you know what I mean? Like, um, <sighs> So and then, uh, then they tried to buy me in again because they saw that we posted our game like on a website, gamingforlinux.com, which is just simply a place where people could see games that are written for Linux. And so she tried, oh, Linux, I, I typed, Liz Linux, a proxy server. We got to violate you. You can't use that. I'm like, yeah, I go, to, you know. Uh, so eventually, you know, when she asked her IT person in the office, maybe they're like, they, they laughed that shit out of there. But other than that, I can't, I can't complain, honestly, as far as like the restrictions go. Chicago has a lot of people on probation and they got a lot of other shit they worry about. And I, I didn't have any terribly much. Uh, I was still going to demos. Uh, and so that was frankly like, like in prison too, like one of the small victories that has just meant everything just to be out there in the street, you know what I mean? And to be part of something again. Uh, even if I'm not, yeah, I'm not throwing bricks at every fucking thing, you know what I mean? But it's like just to be part of the continuum of the movement and stuff like that and to see people. And it was, it was, it was difficult for me, man. I still actually cry pretty spontaneously sometimes. Uh, I still have some, that. I still have some weird habits from prison too. Um, yeah. So, you know, but other than that, I can't complain. Again, I had a lot going for me. Yeah. Um, and but, it's, uh, yeah. I think it's important that people that listen understand that we carry that trauma. Like, Jeremy, you saw me talk several months ago like and i was just weeping um me too man i was crying my eyes out here right and like so like i know you understand like jason you might also but like we carry that shit with us it doesn't just stop at the door and those habits that we that we develop like those don't just stop like i still get mad at my kids and like want to scream and cry if they leave like dirty dishes out you can't do that shit yeah yeah uh, cutting people in line and stuff like that you'd be tripping over oh, shit. <laughs> yes jeremy i'm giving you a big hug jason i'm giving you a big hug both of you um so let's talk about what happened next um you're both free what direction does your activism go what do you what do you start doing what problems do you face if there are any just tell me about like what your free life activism has has started to look like and then what it developed into well, we're gonna leave some specifics out <laughs> but uh yeah no we're very much involved in shit man out here um are you guys just sharing that green drink or is there multiple <laughs> green drinks we, we, this one's empty <laughs> uh 
Um, other stuff, man, you know, uh, the range of resistance isn't just protest marches, although we are pretty prolifically at them things, but uh, we also involved in a range of uh, stuff, like everything from writing to we play in a band um, to, to music and stuff to printing. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a pro. Talk we print it. zines and all that stuff is uh, are one of our mainstays, actually. Talk about why you do that. Why do you print zines? What's the value in that? Oh. Well, I mean... Many reasons. Well, for one, you know the value. You know, I want them to know. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of prisoner support, books of prisoners, zines, and stuff like that. And it's because, like, honestly, like the wall is a physical wall and a fence and stuff like that. But it's not just like for people, but it's also for ideas, right? And so, folks inside often have no access to what actually knowledge and information and updates about what people, especially movements, are doing out there, other than the TV and like the the newspaper or something like that. You know what I mean? And so. Uh, yeah, we send lots of books and lots of zines uh, and internet printouts and stuff like that to folks inside. But it's also the inverse, too. Like, not only are people on the inside obviously oblivious to what's happening in the world, but people on the outside are frankly oblivious about what's the realities of what's happening behind bars. So a lot of our work is also publishing, uh, publishing like uh, writings and art and artwork from incarcerated authors and stuff like that. So we uh, we make zines written by prisoners. So, uh, we all, you know, that type of stuff. That's fucking awesome. God bless. What about well, it's like uh, some coyote said, man, zines are a real weapon. It's time to get lit. You know what I mean? Like um, the pen is often mightier than the sword in some cases, man, especially if you think of how isolated each one of these jails and prisons and stuff like that are, right? They Like, how are they going to hear about this whole jailhouse lawyer strike speak and stuff like that, like coming up in December? Uh, you know what I mean? The, the strike and stuff like that. You, you might be in a type of lockdown prison. The dude at the unit next over, they might be going in on some hunger strike, unified uh, convicts type stuff you don't even know about unless you hear about it from one of the guards, the trustees or something like that. So well, when you put that flag up, we put that shit in the newsletter. We make sure 300 other people get it the next month. You know what I mean? Like, so we're, we're, we're basically trying to uh, build up a web, uh, a network of resistance through their walls, man. And so zines are often the type of publication that could get under the radar, like where they got book bands and stuff like that. Well, this is from a security point of view, often no different than a letter. So again, now granted the, the book bands and the censorship has just gotten off the chain this past couple of years. And that's one of the, one of the struggles that we're fighting against to pierce that wall. Right. But nevertheless, zines are one of our best weapons. Um, so Jeremy, I used to get zines from you in ADX. Uh, like they made it through the mail and then I'd pass that shit on. You'd slide under the door to the orderly who would pass it to the next cell, whatever. Yeah. And we'd like have conversations about that shit because you guys cared enough to send it. Like it didn't just go to me. It went to what? Well, there was only five other people, but it went to five other people. <laughs> and yeah. then they could pass that info on. Yeah. Uh, how many complaints have you two gotten for your handwriting? To be honest. <laughs> I got one from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't be the only one. You know, um, we we, uh, we all want change in society, but I don't think that this is ever <laughs> going to change. Our, our <laughs> but like, and, and even our spelling and our typing, it, it looks the same. I don't know how it works. but uh, oh. uh, Jason, tell me, uh, tell me about the video game. Okay, so... Um, it was actually a thing that both me and Jeremy uh, kind of just thought it would be a good kind of project just for us to both to start off. We're actually both, uh, uh, well, they didn't call it retro gaming back then. It was just game like Nintendo era. We're born in the year of our Lord Nintendo. So, um, yeah, we grew up on this stuff. And uh, I, I, I played a little bit as adults, um, you know, if you call me that. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> So it was so when Jeremy got out, he was we, we he saw Gen Six in the in the, in, the, uh, in the halfway house, and he basically we both lived together, and uh, we're like, oh, this just looks like a fucking video game. So it was a good project that we engaged in together. That was kind of like a way we can kind of like amplify the message of anti-fascism and kind of like talk about its dynamics and create art that would be like of interest to folks. Uh, that you know, even if it was just a cathartic game that you can play on your mobile when you're fucking anywhere. And uh, so it was it was also kind of like a kind of a testing kind of thing to see where it like Jeremy was like the he, he had his PO who was kind of like watching stuff. This was like a safer type of way to contribute to the movement, like using doing a sort of form of art. It's a, it's a free game, of course, uh, and Steam and many other platforms you can play at smashmega.com. It's you play as Antifa and it's like the Mario Black Lock. Um, and uh, you shoot. What? Couple, <laughs> what? Yeah, so it's. Uh, uh, and it's multiplayer, of course. It's like retro in a twin stick shooter, arcade style. Uh, and uh, so we put, uh, and we've been continually doing levels over the last few years as more kind of like dynamics occurred. Uh, er the early levels were like a vaccination site. Um, 
there was like a Chaz type level to try to like defend the space against cop and, and bootlickers, you know, um, who were trying to cause trouble to the autonomous space. And not, now we have levels like campus encampments. We have a crash at conventions level. We have a mad mega level that's like, they throw you, you, you blow up pipelines in a video game, of course, in Minecraft. I mean, Smash Mega, you know. Um, so real educational stuff, or, or at least, <laughs> yeah. And be, because like gaming is kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's it has of course been riddled with like encoded misogyny and sexism, and there's a lot. It's like a battleground, really, um, where I think maybe not. There's not enough anarchist or leftist voices. Um, because it's a, it's just another kind of area which we, we could kind of put these sort of messages in it, and it's fun. We put memes like the twisted tea, uh, which is the the official drink of anti racists a few years ago. <laughs> Remember that time twisted tea? Someone smacked a racist in the. You ever seen that meme, Eric? No. Oh yeah, you gotta see that meme, the twisted tea oh. meme. Oh, <laughs> yeah. so so someone dropped the n bomb uh, and being all racist in the store, and the dude was trying to buy a twisted tea, so he smacked the dude with the twisted <laughs> tea, and it became an instant hit. Like for, for a while, man. There's soup for your family, of course. Uh, yeah. There's the milkshake for Andy. No, uh, you know. Um, yeah. You could fight the QAnon shaman in the Capitol. You know. Uh, he but... was uh this fucking hoe. He was at Inglewood when I was in the shoe. It was him and two others, including this abortion shooter. Oh. And because the QAnon punk got, he got like that special permission from the judge. They had to go to Sprouts. And buy him special food. That motherfucker, yeah. man. Yeah. I was like, you fucking pieces of shit. He's a little feller, too. He's like 5'5". Five, five. Yeah. Um, and he did a psyche vow. That's why he was there. And they wrote him a thing saying he shouldn't be in prison. It would be too hard. I've never seen anyone get that right up before. <laughs> like from psych. It's like, you pieces of shit. Sorry for dying. No, 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 we, Jan we love Chuck on the q and show in particular, but all the Jan Sixers, many of them made it to our game, like the Confederate flag guy is up in there. Um, uh, you battle Rudy Giuliani, he's obvious, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's really ridiculous. We need to put the Jan Sixers kind of thing with, uh, oh, we're political prisoners, mm -hmm. we're hostages of the state. It was like, what an interesting incident uh, when uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said you need to defund the FBI is like, <laughs> they did an insurrection? Like, why the fuck? Everyone's saying now, what's a lib insurrection, right? Um, I think liberals are more likely to be the ones getting in the way of an ad, of an actual insurrection, but With, without a doubt, <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump back to something, Jason, that you said, and you both can touch on it. But I found it interesting. You said that these spaces, it can be video games or electronic, aren't really a stronghold for far leftists, mm -hmm. for anarchists, anti-fascists, whatever. Why do you think that is? And what do we do to counter it more? Because you two are the only two I've ever met. Like, obviously, you'd know more. But, like, I don't know any besides the, the Brothers Hammond. Um, so why do you think that is? And what can we do to enhance that? Um, like, other, other avenues and where, like, leftist ideas, anarchist ideas aren't present. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't know. Um, Oh, I, I gotta, I gotta push back on that just a little bit, man. Because okay, I actually, good, please, I think that there actually is a very exciting current among. And you, and you use Discord, man. Come on, man. Like, dude, honestly, a lot of young hackers and coders and stuff like that. I don't that, know what that is. See, but dude, it's there. It's queer as fuck. It's commie as fuck. It's it's kind of uh, our thing, honestly. So I don't think it's entirely all Gamergate. Um, like for example, is we uh, gamers. Is that a gamer thing? Gamer Gamergate was a phenomenon. And, uh, shit, I was locked up for this when this happened, but um, it was it was basically the the sexist dogpiling of of femme gamers, like uh, and it was it just it, it basically is like an early alt right type of uh phenomenon where it would be like dogpile the 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 woke in gaming type of thing basically, um, and oh, just wow. it would just be like like um what do they call hordes or flocking of like just. Online accounts, it's like random people. Just, just another place for people to insert sexism and racism. Um, and it was called Gamergate. Uh, it was, it was like kind of a conspiracy theory. Who the hell was the, one of the main progenies of the that particular one? They like targeted like, um, like women in gaming reviewers, developers, and stuff like that. But uh, and you know, gaming generally has been very much attached to the military establishment. Call of Duty. Most of these games are actually training. America's Army was a 
training first person shooter and stuff like that. And mostly it's the, the tired old narrative, good guys, bad guys, cops, robbers, terrorists, American soldiers, all this bullshit. Right. But again, I'm just saying that there is an indie DIY current that are just busting out lots of their own DIY games and they, they ain't going for that shit. So I'd like to think that the youth is actually done to burn some shit. So, and we've met a few groups who are doing similar things. Uh, there's an abolitionist gaming network. They did uh they had a workshop at uh, bashback where they were highlighting a few other games. Um, there's another one um, that Smash Mega just got in in New York right now. It's um, Games Against the Empire. I think it's an outdoor event happening in New York. Uh, Games Against the Empire, I think, later this month that we just kind of kind of got inside. Uh, we got accepted to be in the game. So there are plenty of people trying to carve these spaces out. Um, although definitely you're right. The perception is that it's like it's like Gamergate. Uh, it's I had just... no idea. Like, I don't want to sound like a jackass. I just didn't know, like, this stuff is beyond me. Um we were like, yeah. uh, and there, there's there's plenty of like uh, like uh, leftish lefty streamers like Hasanabi, everyone knows. Um, Thought Slime is another uh, YouTuber. Uh, Red Tube is, I think, that they self-identify as, uh, uh, and then they're like gamer leftists mm -hmm. that have YouTube channels where they do um, they talk they touch on political issues and sometimes it's just exposing this fucking right wing grifter liar type thing to you know. Um, but yeah, there, there is a scene and, uh, I think that it, it's, it has the potential to become more, more ubiquitous because it, like gaming is a thing that millions of people do. Um, maybe they said that we'd never make a career out of it as kids. Oh, video game tester. But now it's like billions of dollars. Like beyond that, it's, a, it's yeah, we're more into the indie gaming thing. Anyway, it's like unique ideas. People have really kind of like they, there's games that deal with mental, mental illness re resulting to like gender identity and all that so there's a great avenue for ideas you know um so i might be ignorant about this also but jeremy i thought your work was priceless about like giving information to people who wouldn't have it like basically what you did with hacking is the exact same thing you're doing with prison just it's tangible yeah uh, right now and once again i could be a dummy i don't see hacking happening i don't see government stuff yeah. getting like given to people to help spread knowledge is that is my perception right? And if so, like, what the fuck's going on? I mean, it's a good question. I think everybody's sitting here wondering where the hell's anonymous. What the fuck we you know? Where really? that? Yeah. Um, I'll say this, man. Like techies, and especially in the United States and Western countries, are basically complicit with with the industrialist nightmare, with the war machine. Um, more or less have have decided that they you know might have their own individual ethics and opinions and stuff like that. But when it comes to the paycheck, the cybersecurity industry, or developing facial recognition software or crypto bullshit and stuff like that. Like they bought in, you know, techies, you know, it are very much on the privileged part of society, man. Like it's white collar jobs and offices making six figures and shit like that. And, and, and at the bitter uh, of the Peter Thiel's of the world, you know what I mean? Of the Elon Musk's and the, and the Zuckerberg's. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't, you know, when I got it the first time, especially too, I was like, dude, I actually don't see too much of a future uh, in, in using technology to, and also a lot of these techies like think that they discovered democracy and they're going to develop some tech tool to be more democratic or be, have discovered consensus decision-making and stuff like that. And people do this without computers for so long. So honestly, I think that the most that hackers can really offer um, besides hacking shit, which is, you know, which is what needs to get done. And it is happening. I'll talk about it in a second. But mostly, though, I think it's just about hackers who have these type of skills should share up op security skills uh, to protect people who are like at risk or vulnerable, especially in entering this nightmarish Trump administration, how you can secure your communications and protect your privacy and your comrades' privacy and so forth. And then other stuff, too. Yeah, maybe it was someone like me. I do websites for like, you know, groups and stuff like that or Stuff like that. But ultimately, though, in the United States, it's kind of washed up. You go to hacker con, man, half the people there are trying to work for the NSA. You know? But it's not it's not always like that, man. Like there is an original hacker vision that is anti-authoritarian, that is uh criminally minded. And uh and if you I think if you leave the United States, you get a you could see that a little bit more. Like both of us, we actually had a chance to go to um to Germany to uh for the chaos chaos camp, the hacker camp. Dude, that shit was so fucking banging, man. It really did give me hope, actually, uh, that there was like fucking 15,000 hackers raving for seven days straight, all anarchist trans flags everywhere, dude. It really did feel like this was actually the center of the universe type shit. So there is a hacker scene out there, man, but, you know, but I guess don't like look to find it. Like it starts with you, you know, but yeah. So I would I also would love to see more sabotage and more disruption, more doxing of police officers and especially like it honestly worked. We, we got to catch up, man. These fucking nightmarish Israelis and fucking drone warfare and, and United States military stuff is recruiting all these hackers, right? So 
I think uh, we, and this is what I was, one of the other things besides going after police and military, I went after other hackers who were fucking working for them, man, the white hats, the sellouts and stuff like that. Because not only there needs to be repercussions and deterrence for future people who might think that that's like a safe thing to do to work for them and stuff like that, but also because these foolios are clueless and incompetent, and they also have the keys to the kingdom, passwords to these systems and stuff like that, and their Gmails and stuff. They don't know what they're doing, man, so they'll be more than happy to take that off your hands. Listening to you guys talk about technology is so interesting. It's <laughs> so neat. Um, I've got a thousand questions left. Um, we're I need to like eventually just let you say what the hell you want to talk about. But just a question from me before before I go into like uh before I let you guys take the mic, basically. Um, Jeremy, you got ratted on. You got ratted on hard. Um, does that like when you are now talking with people, either about technology or about anything, does that stay with you? Or have you been able to shake that and be like, I can trust, I can lean into this? Like, how has that affected you in terms of organizing? Um, well, I'll say and this. That's hard. Like, I'm not trying to like, make you sad or nothing. No, it's a tough question. And it gets to the crux of it, honestly, um, because I think everybody's actually wanting to do stuff, but wanting to do so in a way that keeps everybody safe. And then, like, you see all these cases and stuff like that. Um, I've always erred on the side of do shit and break shit and like worry about the consequences later. I've actually not really been known for having the best security and stuff like that. Obviously I've been caught a million times. Right. Uh, but I don't have any regrets about that. Um, I will say this, as far as like the people who I testified against me on this particular trial and stuff like that, like I, they weren't like my close comrades that I've been with every day or that I've known for years in my life. So there wasn't like a, like a feeling of betrayal on this particular oh. incident case uh, that I may have had if it was like my comrade who I've known my whole life. That had turned turned me and stuff like that. This is just some fucking loudmouth on the internet, Sabu Hector Monsiger, uh, who was was there's a lot shame. of like, there was a lot of flags there. He was uh, the internet loudmouth, loved to brag about shit other people did and all that stuff. Um, but anyways, he he testified. He was like, oh no, fucking figure to go fit. You know what I mean? Like it was pretty obvious. Uh, as far as now, um, again, it's like with everything. Like there's layers of trust. There are like some things that I'm willing to do like at a demo with random people who I might just jump in at, with at that, that particular moment if it seems right or seems because we're only talking about misdemeanor level type stuff, right? I mean, <laughs> like uh, for the most part, but uh, yeah, it's just layers of trust. You you, you kind of want to build trust slowly, do things with people like on regular stuff and see how they react to situations and so forth. And then on it's need to know and compartmentalization all the way otherwise. But I don't do anything terribly crazy anymore other than like, you know, I, I keep up on the OPSEC stuff. And the other thing I'll say is just read cases, read dockets, read indictments and stuff like that, and learn from the mistakes of other people that they've made and stuff like that um, before you choose to get involved in something. Just so you're aware, you know, I'm not I'll surprised. Just, I'll, I'll just keep. Um, tell, me, tell me what's been on your mind recently. Tell me either what you've been doing, what you've been feeling, what you want to do. I, I just want to give you an open forum. Like, just talk to me. Wobsy well, Palestine. And Trump and this shit is like, we have a higher calling here. We got to give it everything we got. Um, stuff that happened recently. We were at the DNC. That was a whole bunch of shit. Um, Chicago, obviously. Yeah. For 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 me personally, like uh, we do a lot of prisoner support. I've been into this like digitization of mail and censorship stuff. But yeah, but we're we're out there though. So I mean, um, I, I mean, mean <laughs> we're gonna need to continue doing movement stuff, building power. Like with other folks who are who are doing similar works in uh, prison abolition, mutual aid, uh, you know, uh, anyone can get involved in these things and should, and and that that is a way to build community and experiment in solidarity economy. Um, you know, we we try to do some other type of cool things like uh, we do the we do with the writing down the walls. It's like our third year organizing that one. So generally, you both organize it over there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, is there a fourth one. Oh, it's fucking fourth year. Uh, right on the walls yeah uh, we, we like to, to do a generator show too like you know we, we're involved in bands and there's a lot of good music in chicago so it's like we love to bring music to prisoners right of course so like it's just... did i see you all playing a show outside of a jail <laughs> might have yeah it sounds like some weird <laughs> well did i just snitch did i see a band performing outside <laughs> no, of jail? It's, it's an open secret that we like to fucking make music and we hate prisons um noise demos like, yeah and this is a noise yeah yeah um so that, that's just, a, you know, we'd like to create interventions in uh, society that, like, you know, gets people to kind of rethink, be, like, outside of a jail is like, no one expects to see some something as something like a protest and a celebration and such a, like, a, 
So we do the, the noise analysis generator stuff. Um, what else we got? Um, the prison censorship thing is kind of one of the biggest. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the prison support solidarity stuff. We got ABC out here. We got Books of Prisoner out here. Um, probably, like you said, it's going down. Zines is kind of one of our mainstays. Like we send this to all the political prisoners, and there's like several hundred other people on the mailing list and stuff. Shout like out, it's that. going down also. Yeah, so people could get like a subscription to it's going down or any other publication or any social media feed and stuff like that. So we are uh, um, basically trying to build build those networks, man, of folks inside outside because uh, you know folks are coming out one day, you know what I mean, and then folks who got nothing to lose and everything to gain from the overthrow of the system, you know what I mean. You've seen it, you know what I mean. So we got millions out there, fucking ready, you know what I mean. How how are we gonna do this, you know? And so our panel next month is all about politicized prisoners hmm. um and so you both and i've really respected it uh like the person i rep the most is not a political prisoner it's just my friend it's just my friend who has nobody you all i think randy. Total... yeah randy, smile, randy smile. Smile. <laughs> yeah we did like a concert for him a benefit show we raised eight hundred dollars whoa cool yeah nice <laughs> oh hot shit uh so Talk about why it's important. Like, we don't have that much time left, but, like, please talk about why it's important to support all prisoners instead of just, like, this upper class of political prisoners. Either of you? Well, the, the, essentially the crux is that no one should be behind bars. It is a torturous, like, vestigial remnants of of the fucking slavery of the United States. Um, and uh, for those reasons alone, we should support every single prisoner in the right for freedom. Um, that's That's the first base. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the second base is that, you know, like what you said, that everyone's going to, unless you're in there for life and you deserve to be fucking fight for your freedom and have a dignified life if you're fucking stuck there, but everyone's going to get out. A lot of people are going to get out and then they're going to be part of society. And, you know, if we want to talk about, uh, changing and abolishing the carceral aspects of society, we have to treat all humans as if they were capable of, of liberation and, um, and, and, and. And so for that reason, every prisoner should be supported and every everyone free, because if, if we say some people are deserving of like respect and others aren't, that then like, OK, that then maybe you are a warden. Like maybe maybe a lot of people walking out street are guards yeah. um, of a, of a open open air prison society. And uh, and so I think that um, because the thing is, like a, lo a lot of uh, everyone in prison is like there's there's they're, they're often the choices that they have maybe that you could save and let them there are like logical reactions to living in a society that has deprived people of like the meaningful resources of ways of living. Like, uh, yeah, I got laid off. So I had to do this scam and now I got caught and now I'm in prison. Well, like that could be anywhere. It could be you just because, um, just because it hasn't happened to you doesn't make you better than the people who are, who had, who it did happen to. And it might happen to you next month. Um, maybe not for everybody. Um, but the like, of course, if you look at prisons, this uh, large majority is people of color, right? Of course, so um, plenty of people walk around with privileges and, and maybe not think of themselves as even possible for it to happen to like white folks, talking, right? But um, prison system does is now, of course, expanding and, and will take you in because you fucking got caught up in the same shit too. And I don't I wanna, know. I want to point out to people that the stock prices of Core Civic rose like eighty percent. Um, and that's not on accidents because they know that those joints are about to be packed. They're about to, they're, they're, they're talking about the, the money involved. I'm not talking about the money. At, at the first off, deport, uh, imprisoning, and you're going to imprison before you try to deport a million people because there's like dudes, due process and all that. Is like, uh, that, that is an unfathomable monstrosity that must be challenged at every fucking level by every single member of society. Um, but, okay, and then the cost of it, you're talking, okay, so like they, they got so much stock, like you're talking about to do all that, you're talking, Numbers that most people don't even talk about. They're talking about trillions of dollars to do this massive. And then the thing is, once they build these prisons, they're fucking there and they're going to continue using them. Like, okay, let's let's say like the, they do some fucking fascist nightmare stuff in the next few years, right? Then they then the next ten years that prison's still there and it's gonna they're gonna have every excuse to build new beds and keep making money. So it's mm -hmm. like what happened in the last few days is like an extreme acceleration of the prison industrial complex, unlike on a level that we haven't seen. I think. And yeah, um, yeah, like Jason was saying, the expansion of these cop cities and these prisons and stuff like that, they they know what the future actually is. It's going to be 
more the state is just going to more and more resemble a military police state the erosion of social services uh and it's the future for all of us there even those of us who are out here at minimum security are going to see more carceral type controls uh everything from like facial recognition to credit scores and all this bullshit right so yeah our work is necessarily stop the construction of letcher county prison bop trying to build a new prison illinois oh they yeah, fight prison yeah fight toxic prisons right they're trying to build their they just voted i think last week the DOP said, yeah, we actually do want that prison, right? Uh, Illinois is, is about to build a whole new billion dollar fucking uh, prison system to replace Stateville, which is so old, so fucked up, so torturous that they even the judge said, yeah, we got to get everybody out of there by next week type shit, right? So they're about to build a billion dollars and something, but there's obvious solutions here. Let people fucking go, right? And so um, the back to your original question and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I kind of think all people who are behind bars in this country are political. Like it's there's politics permeates white supremacy permeates through every aspect of that court do you think it's a fair shot when you get up there and see that judge or that jury or the or the those who made those laws and stuff like that um so i think about all the folks who are locked up who might not have even been like political in the sense that they got arrested you know breaking a window or something like that but uh their whole lives might have been political you know what i mean or or whatever they had to do like jason has said just to make it in this this capitalist doggy dog world you had to resort to criminality one time now they put you in a box like no and that, that's the future for all of us unless we stop it um and so i will also just say that like while i do think maybe abc's like support of political prisoners and stuff like that might be a little bit narrow to our taste because you know we do all we, we support those folks too but we support everybody like and don't put anybody on pedestals and stuff like that but i do think that it is absolutely essential that we have the backs of those who actually do sit out there our comrades who actually do put in the work for struggling for self-determination in a better world we got We got to look after these folks, and so that's why we do have formations like ABC, and that's why we do look after political prisoners, for lack of a better word. Maybe a different word is more appropriate. But I look at like the social media sites, and I see like a group has like ten thousand likes, and I think if each of you wrote one letter, like you can make such a dent in that system, but also like lift up so many people. There's enough. Like we can support everybody. There's enough resources. Um, before we go, there's been some some sad moments and some happy moments in this talk. I'd like to know like, what gives you guys hope right now? Like what makes you smile? What makes you most happy? Whether it's in the movement outside or both, what makes my two friends happy? Well, it's a fucked up world society, right? But I want to say that we do count our small wins when we got them, right? And I will maybe tell a story when I was a prison and now too and stuff like that. Like in prison, you might be in the hole 24 hours a day, right? You're fucking banging on the doors and nothing, right? But you know what makes you happy? The small wins. When fucking, when you you might be flooding the deck with everybody else, right? And the fucking, you might see the cop slip and fall and fucking get wet. And you will be laughing about that shit for months. Yeah, you're still in a hole and stuff like that. But man, it fucking felt good watching that happen. You know what I mean? Uh, and the same now, you know what I mean? Like when you see people in the world like fucking strike out and, and get some get back and stuff like that, even though we might not have the upper hand overall right now, but... We take take joy and pride in those little moments that we do have our wins. Absolutely. Jason. I'm thinking this is solidarity. Uh, because like it's it's easy to be alienated in this shit society, right? But um a lot more people give a fuck about the well-being of others than than, than maybe we might know about because it's not like everywhere. Like this is it's set up to where we shouldn't, right? Like, you know, drive your car to your job, go back, your fucking trad fam or whatever the hell um and uh it's it's alienating but um but we're, we're seeing more like genuine acts of solidarity and more people willing to take chances to change it i think that that is a beautiful thing that keeps moving and then like a lot of people who have given in or i almost say given in who just experienced despair and alienation all that um they, they could be part of like you know of, of movements of solidarity and then you, i think that that is one of the things that like just seeing and witnessing and participating in it gives meaning and gives you hope um and uh I, th I think that's one of the things that's one of the reasons why i haven't given in to like a pessimism pessimism or like a or a misanthropy that is like uh doesn't lead to change in society because i do believe that like we are going to need to give a fuck about each other and there's that article like i'm i've lost ways of trying to teach the other people to give a fuck about other people is like we gotta keep finding new ways to get people to give a fuck about each other because then 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 we do give into a fascist nightmare hey just letting you both know uh i'm doing a uh my one year is december 12th so on december 14th 
Oh, uh, me and my wife are having like a free wedding. Like we got married inside. So we're doing our free ceremony. And then also like a celebration party, like, cause we're free. Uh, if you guys can get to Denver, we can put you up. You're both invited. Just letting you know. It'd be great to have you out. Let's go, man. That'd be great. We might have been. Yeah. So obviously like we're pretty far away, but like if you can be honored do whatever to get there, pleasant. it'd be a blessing. Yeah. Uh, and before Liberty, uh, I'm just going to take this time to shout out Randy Platt, Smiles. Um, <laughs> he is at ADX still. He will be there for the next 14 years. Um, he is there for slicing a cop who abused him relentlessly in the shoe. He sliced him through a bean slot. And <laughs> Whoa. Spot, yeah, God is bitch ass. Um, <laughs> at USB Florence. So he is going to be there and we are his support. His support is strangers. It's me, it's Jeremy, it's Jason, it's uh, it's all the people that write him. So I encourage everyone to please write Randy or to write anyone. Write a prisoner. Mm -hmm. um, it can change their life. It can make someone's life go from hell to beauty so quick. Um, how do people get a hold of you or what, what do you recommend people do? What's your final sign-off message? One of you better answer. Oh man. Keep organizing, keep agitating, keep escalating, um, keep supporting those that do. Not everyone needs to do everything, right? We need a lot of different people to do about a lot of different types of things. Um, so find a niche where you feel good, where you're effective, um, and and keep keep those who are who are who are working and swimming in the same direction in your hearts and uh and and keep keep a lookout for those who are fucking are do are doing everything they can and who have fallen through through the cracks in the system and you know just like you said right prisoners man you said fourteen years right but I don't think the future is a guarantee you know what I mean like I'm hard it's hard to even imagine an, another election in four years uh, that it's going to be at all the same you know what I mean and we also know that there's folks inside who are going to be there so they say forever right unless something changes unless the system is overthrown. And so it's on all of us, man, who are out here. Like our freedom is actually, it's a privilege and a responsibility. You know, we're, me and you, we're, we're some of the lucky ones to get out. You know what I mean? Like, and like you said, your comrade and stuff like that inside, man, is they're waiting for us out here to do the right thing. You know, so let's get out there and do it. I love you both. Love you too, man. Really fun. Pleasure, for real. Uh, Liberty, Honor. I appreciate you and this Lee friend. Sign us out. Y'all, this has been awesome. Really appreciating the clarity that y'all brought to this conversation. I'm hoping that everybody's going to join us on November 23rd for the next conversation in this series. Big thanks to you, Eric, and also Josh, uh, for putting this book together and making this series happen. It's just been amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Have a great Thank night, y'all. Yes. Good night, y'all. See <laughs> y'all later. Much respect and solidarity, y'all. Yeah. All right, bye. Good night, folks.